Well, good evening and welcome. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I am Steve. I'm the assistant uh, pastor here at Worthing Tab. Um, now, it's great uh, to be able to, to spend time with you this evening going through God's Word. God's Word is like nothing else on earth. N neither in heaven either. It is, it is like water to a dry ground. When the land is dry and there seems to be no life, water comes along, the rains come, and all of a sudden life bursts forth. It's like the, the sun, when it hits the snow, it just melts it away and brings warmth and life. The cold is driven away. And if we will allow God's word to speak to us this evening, it will wash over us. It will bring life. It will bring peace. And it will most definitely bring hope. Not hope in humanity or our ability, but in God, in who he is and in what he has done for us in and through Jesus Christ, his son. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we rejoice this evening. We rejoice in who you are. And Father, we ask that you would graciously, by your Holy Spirit, draw near to us, that you would comfort us, that you would bring your peace and your hope as we reflect on your word. Father, may we see the splendor and the beauty of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as we come to your word this evening. Lord, we thank you so much. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, if you're anything like me, uh, I'm sure you can look back over your life and think of a time when you've done something wrong, something you regret doing. I have many of those. Uh, one, one of those, uh, uh, quite a tame one, was when I was about, uh, I was about 17 or 18 and I was, um, I was trying to show off to my mates. Um, at the time I was, I was taking driving lessons um, and my mum was out for the evening and uh, we, we had a work van because at the time my, my mum had a, had, a, had a florist shop and uh, it was the delivery van and uh, I thought it would be where we lived, the, the house behind the house there was like a little dead end back road and uh, I thought it would be a great idea to to bundle my mates in the back and just drive up and down uh, this, this little road before I obviously passed my test. I thought it would be absolutely fine. What, what could possibly go wrong? Well, um, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, yeah, it wasn't a good idea. Um, and I managed to reverse into a wall. Uh, it, it wasn't a big crash. It, well, this, this one wasn't a big crash. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, there's been others. I'm afraid there's been others. But, uh, but I knew at that point that my mum was going to kill me. And uh, she had every right to. She was well within her rights to throttle me. And, uh, but she didn't actually throttle me. That's why I'm still here today, which, is, which I'm pleased to say. But I was in trouble. But I'm also sure that we have had moments in our lives when we, we know that we didn't deserve punishment. When we haven't done things wrong. Things that we're not guilty of doing. But we have been accused of doing things that we haven't done. And the pain at this point is far worse 
than when we know when we deserve to be punished. It's an awful thing to be accused of something that isn't true. To be slandered is a horrible thing. It's so wrong. It's a complete injustice. God himself is enraged at slander. Uh, just, for, just one uh, reference to that is Psalm 101. He says, Whoever slanders his neighbour secretly, I will destroy. Whoever has a haughty look and an arrogant heart, I will not endure. That's strong words. The Apostle Paul, in his, in his letter to the Romans, uh, when he's describing the, the state of humanity, he gives a long list. He's saying this. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are all full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree... That those who practice such things deserve to die. They not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. There is something that is so ungodly, so evil about slander and lies and a false tongue. And we all have this, this sense, that, that understanding of the wretchedness of slander. We all have that sense of the complete injustice of it. And this is the situation we find in Psalm 7 with King David. David has been slandered. He has had accusations thrown at him that are not true. What we do need to remember, though, as, as we read this psalm going forward with uh, King David, is that he is not a sinless man. He is not a perfect man, just like we are. But what he does, he, uh, he shows us, he, he reveals to us how to deal with the injustice of slander. He points to something far greater than just this lifetime. David is looking forward to a time, a final judgment, when God's justice will reign over all the earth. That is how he can deal with and handle the situation that he finds himself in, in such a God-fearing, God-honouring way, even though the situation is very difficult. He knows that the situation may not be dealt with in his life on earth, but one day God will bring judgment, the, the evil of the wicked, to an end. He will judge the evil of the wicked and establish the righteous, those who trust in God. We need to reflect on these words. We need to learn from David and the one that he is ultimately pointing to. The Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ. The righteous judge. It's so easy for us to, to react to in, injustice in our own strength. Uh, with our own understanding, with our own thoughts and our own feelings on the matter. This is what we see happening all around us in the world. And it is chaos. The reason why, I think, is because our foundations are wrong. We start from the wrong place. We don't start from the right place with the right understanding. But David, he points us to something else. 
He points us to seek something far greater than our own understanding. He points us to God. He points us to put our trust in God. The God of this Bible. And no one else. No one else. David is um, he's also he's described as being a man after God's own heart. That is, is quite, a, quite a feat for any man or woman. The reason isn't because he's perfect, because he wasn't, but his heart, the very, the very thing that drives him echoes something. It portrays something of the image of God. In his life, he tried to put God first. Granted, he didn't always get it right. But he tried to do all things out of a love for God. And the way that David deals with the situation and speaks of the situation that he is in reveals to us the very nature of our God and how magnificent God is. So let's begin to unravel God's word this evening and find our peace and our hope for the future in God and in his justice. So uh, the psalm is titled, A Shagion of David, which he sang to the Lord concerning the words of Cush, a Benjaminite. Now, there is uh, much debate uh, over the title of this psalm and what it refers to because the word uh, shigayon is a word that is untranslatable to, to any certain degree. So, but, it, but it would seem fair to, to err on the side of it referring to, to some kind of struggle, a trouble maybe, or as one writer puts it, David, stung by an unjust reproach, appeals to God. So it could possibly be a strong appeal to God. And so he makes this strong appeal to God, which he sang to the Lord concerning the words of a particular man, Cush to whom there is no direct reference. Which may seem strange, and there, may ha- there, there, there have been many, many thoughts put forward with regards to who this might be a reference to, but we don't know for certain. Even Martin Luther, who has lots to say, states in his commentary on the Psalms, the matter remains a- as much as ever in dispute as to who this reference is to. From scripture, we know that there was more than one occasion when David was slandered and spoken ill of among his people. uh, And he did not, uh, for the actions that he did not commit. There was uh, Ahithophel, there was Saul, there was uh, Absalom, even his son, there was Shammai, the, 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 it goes on. We just don't know. But what I think, maybe, by not mentioning the perpetrator, David has remained innocent. He has kept his integrity in the matter. This doesn't mean that that we don't ever mention to a person uh, who has wronged us, you know, like to trusted friends or or to the police or, or some kind of situation like that. But in the sense of an open public forum, we must hold our tongue. We mustn't go splattering our lives on Facebook or Twitter or those kind of open forums. Even those cryptic, snide remarks that people make. God knows the intention of the heart. As David warns in verse 9, you who test the minds and hearts, O righteous God. God sees the intention and motive of every heart. That's one of the reasons why God is the righteous judge. 
So I think David, by keeping quiet, has remained innocent in the situation. Then there is one last clue in the title to help us understand what is going on. He tells us that they are a Benjaminite. Now we know that King Saul, the, the, the king before David who was trying to kill David, was a Benjaminite. Again, this information doesn't single out one person. But it helps us understand that the person who was accusing David was close to Saul. And the accusation against David was to do with how he has dealt with Saul and how he had come to be seated on the throne. And so these accusations of slander and misconduct were flying about the city and people were discussing the matter everywhere. So what does David do? Does he try and fight back in a, in a public slanging match? Does he share it on Facebook, on Twitter? No. He runs straight to God. Verse 1. O oh Lord my God, in you do I take refuge. Save me from all my pursuers and deliver me. David knows who God is. He comes to God appealing to the justice of God and trusting in the character of God. Knowing that God can condemn or justify a person on the very intention of their heart. He runs straight to the arms of God for protection and begins to plead his case before the Lord. This is, it goes so, so against what the world would have you do or the world's way of thinking. You've got to fight your own corner. Stand up for your own rights. Give as good as you get. But not David. He begins to show the right way to deal with the horrible situation that he finds himself in, that we too may find ourselves in one day, if we haven't already. He seeks God. He puts God first. And as we go on to read uh, verse 2, he makes it more personal. Now, uh, when, I, when I read this, I'm going to change the they in verse 2 to he. The reason being is because it is in the singular. So some translations have they to follow the flow from verse 1, which is plural. O Lord my God, in you do I take refuge. Save me from all my pursuers and deliver me. But he then goes on in verse 2, and it should read personally like this. Lest like a lion he tear my soul apart, rending it to pieces with none to deliver. By keeping with this translation, I think we, we see more clearly that David is echoing forward to an end point, an ultimate end, a final point of the destruction of his soul with none to deliver him unless he is found in God. Outside of God, we have no hope. We have no hope of finding one who is able to deliver us. This isn't a nice picture that David is putting before us. The final picture he paints is of his soul being ripped apart by a savage lion. There will always be people who don't like us, who will try to do us harm. But there is an ultimate enemy and he will do anything to stop us from coming to God. He is the father of life. Uh, sorry, he is the father of lies. And God, God warns us later through Peter in uh, 1 Peter 5.8. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion 
seeking someone to devour. David seeks God straight away for help. But the world, a man's enemy, God's enemy, Satan, which I think David is prophetically alluding to, would have you think about your, your own self-righteousness by getting you to think about how you have been wronged and consuming your thoughts with how you have been mistreated and the injustice that you have had to deal with. When you are so consumed with yourself, you are not focused on the end. And how will you be able to stand before God and give an account for how you have acted towards others if you have been so consumed with yourself. We have a choice how we treat others. That is incredibly hard sometimes. But are we ever justified to mistreat others? On this occasion, David has kept his integrity. He has warned us of the event, but he himself has not slandered in return. David goes on, he goes even further in verses 3 and 5, and he pleads his case of innocence, saying, O Lord my God, if I have done this, if there is wrong in my hands, if I have repaid my friend with evil or plundered my enemy without cause, let the enemy pursue my soul and overtake it and let him trample my life to the ground and lay my glory in the dust. Selah. David comes to God as the final judge. In David's dealings with Saul, which you can read in, in 1 Samuel, he was innocent to the claims that came against him, claims that he had taken the throne by force or by the, by the shedding of blood or, or mistreated Saul. But David doesn't boast in his innocence. He doesn't gloat in the fact that this time he is innocent. How quick are we sometimes to forget the wrongs that we've done? And when we see others or others do wrong to us, we just throw the book straight at them. We can be so quick to pass judgment and condemn Jesus said in Matthew, uh, Matthew 7, Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the me measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye. You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. David humbly comes to God and seeks God to check his heart and is even willing, if God can find fault, to lay his glory, his everything, all that he is. God is justified to destroy his soul to dust. David is a believer in God. He trusts in God. David has confessed and sought forgiveness and pardon from God for the sins that he has committed. When David addresses God as, uh, O oh Lord my God, in verse 3, it is in submission to him as Lord and Saviour. David is not approaching the throne out of arrogance, but genuine humility and with a con contrite heart. He is asking the Lord to act against the wicked, 
the ones who do not care for the things of God. They do not care for God. And because of his genuineness of heart, he cries out to the Lord in verse 6, Arise, O Lord, in your anger. Lift yourself up against the fury of my enemies. Awake for me. You have appointed a judgment. Let the assembly of the peoples be gathered about you. Over it, return on high. Return over what? Why does the Lord need to return on high? When is the Lord's judgment? Let me share some of my thoughts on the beauty of God's word this evening. I think here King David is looking forward to the very end. He is, he is referring to the resurrection of Christ. Lord, take your rightful place. Sit on the throne in the midst of your people. Hear the prayers of your saints. Arise, O Lord, in your anger. Lift yourself up against the fury of my enemies. Awake for me. We know that from, from other scriptures that God doesn't sleep. It almost seems rude of, of David to, to address God in this way. To be telling the Lord to, to rise from, from a sleeping slumber. However, sleep is often a metaphor for death. David is saying, rise up. Awake from the grave. Because when the Lord rose from the grave, he rose from the grave to the position of judge. So David declares, you have appointed a judgment. Let the assembly of the peoples be gathered about you. Over it, return on high. Literally, for the sake of your people, return on high. Jesus Christ has returned to the throne. And the enemies of God have been made his footstool. This is great news. But it also, it is also solemn news. As we carry on reading through the verses, in verses 8 and 11, the Lord judges the peoples. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to the integrity of that is in me. Oh, let the evil of the wicked come to an end. And may you establish the righteous. You who test the minds and hearts, O oh righteous God. My shield is with God, who saves the upright in heart. God is a righteous judge and a God who feels indignation every day. David here isn't talking about a perfect righteousness. He was, he was talking about this one-time incident that had arisen against him, this act of slander against his name. King David has not dealt or did not deal with King Saul in a wrong manner. David did not come against the Lord's anointed in an ungodly manner. His actions were true and honest and upright. And he, in this instant, was innocent. And he pleads with the righteous judge to deal with his case. Because he knows who God is, in verse 9. Oh, let the evil of the wicked come to an end, and may you establish the righteous. You who test the minds and hearts, O righteous God, God is not fooled. There is a verse in Psalm 19 and it says this, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. We can say the right thing. 
We can even do the right thing. But the thoughts and the intentions of our actions may be completely wicked. And this is what God sees. And he knows. And this is the God whom we will stand before when we die. I like how Pastor Rich said it this morning. God knows right from wrong. It's as simple as that. Because he can test the heart and mind of every person. Something that we cannot do. And, verse, and because, verse 11, God is a righteous judge and a God who feels indignation every day. Do not be fooled. God will judge the sins of the world. Jesus warned in, in Luke 12. And he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentiful. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. King David's heart was rich toward God. God was his shield. His trust was in God to forgive him and to save him from his sin. David had repented previously to this act. He, he asked God, we learn in Psalm 51, Have mercy on me, O God, according to, to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done evil and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. David is asking God to deliver him from the injustice that he was facing. But God was using this situation in King David's life to shine forward to the life of the true eternal King, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is where we see the greatest injustice the world has ever seen. Appease the justice of our holy God. On the cross where Jesus died, we see the righteous die for the unrighteous. John the Baptist declared when Jesus was coming toward him, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. Jesus Christ is the one that David sees sitting on the throne. The Lamb of God sacrificed for the sins of the world. And if we will trust in God's way of salvation. That God sent his son to be crucified for our sin. And that he died on the third day and rose from the grave. We will be saved. Even David saw a way of salvation. If his enemies would repent. But 
if you do not repent, this is the solemn word to you this evening. Verses 12 and 16. If a man does not repent, God will wet his sword. He has bent and readied his bow. He has prepared for him his deadly weapons, making his arrows fiery shafts. Behold, the wicked man conceives evil and is pregnant with mischief and gives birth to lies. He makes a pit, digging it out, and falls into the hole that he has made. His mischief returns upon his, his own head, and on his own skull his violence descends. This is the reality we face if we will not repent and seek after God. He will judge us for our sins against him. There is no peace and there is no hope outside of God. Only eternal separation from the presence of God. But what hope is there for those who do repent? What peace is there for those who do repent and ask for forgiveness and seek after God? We will rejoice in the presence of the Lord. Verse 17. I will give to the Lord the thanks due his righteousness. His righteousness. And I will sing praise to the name of the Lord the Most High. As it is written... What no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined. What God has prepared for those who love him. David knows who God is. David is revealing to us the heart of God. Sometimes it seems that, that God may be absent or far away. And that we cannot understand the dark circumstances that take place in this world. These things are beyond us. But there is a time in the future when the whole earth will be gathered around the throne of God to be judged. And the justice of God will be seen. God has warned us. God has warned you this evening. You have heard the word of God. Do not test the patience of God. Repent. Turn from your sin and ask God to forgive you, to forgive the very things that Christ went to the cross for and find peace this evening and hope for eternity. Amen.